Okay. From the beginning. Right. Well, I, well, I want to start in Second Corinthians six, and I I will say that um, after, <laughs> gosh, I tell you, you know, when you're watching a human being be pointlessly brutalized, and people standing around that have cameras and they're taking video of this, and you know, I was thinking to myself, if I was there, I would be so in there with fists flying and feet flying. And, you know, I know I'm old compared and small compared to these big guys that were beating up on this kid. But hell, I'd give it everything I got. You know, it's, I just, I don't know how anybody can stand there and watch somebody be brutalized and take a video of it. I just, I can't, I can't even go there in my mind. I think it's part of what the, not the, the Christians around the world that look at America and say American Christians are asleep. They're just asleep. You know, there was that one Iranian girl, I think it was an Iranian woman, and she's here in the United States, and she's a Christian, and she said, I want to go back to Iran, and the people around her are like, what? Why would you want to do that? She said, American Christians are just asleep. She said, at least in, in Iran, when you're being persecuted, you feel like you're doing something for the Lord. You feel like that the battle is real here. It's, you know, just la, 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 you know, and, and this thing really got me stirred up on the inside. And I, I immediately, the verse that came to my mind was the apostle Paul, where he said, our heart is enlarged. And I didn't, I, I knew it was in Corinthians somewhere. I, it's kind of funny because I, I finished teaching on Sunday morning in second Corinthians chapter six. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, Right where I had stopped in 2 Corinthians 6.10, the verse that I wanted was 2 Corinthians 6.11. And that's what, what came to me after watching the, the Facebook stuff on Jimmy's Facebook last night, you know, 2 Corinthians 6.11, because as I shared on Sunday about Corinthians, you know, by the time Paul was writing 2 Corinthians, there were false apostles and false brothers that had infiltrated the church at Corinth, and they had turned the church, um, it, it started to sway the church against the Apostle Paul. That's where he writes this, that huge uh, little paragraph of reproof in 2 Corinthians 11 about, you know, we, you know, we didn't behave like the false apostles. We didn't take from you. We didn't belittle you, you know, and, and you know, and, and then he has that ironic statement about, you know, we, we were too weak to do that. You know, and so here in Second Corinthians six, he's he's pleading with the Corinthian church, and he says in verse eleven, "Our mouth is open to you. You know, we're teaching you, we're talking to you, we're in communication with you, and that's where real Christian maturity starts. You know, real Christian maturity starts with open communication, and it's amazing to me um, in the Christian world." How many people, when you, you look at your cell phone and there's somebody calling you and you, you, you just don't feel like talking to them, and so you simply do nothing, no text, no email, no phone call, it, and I, I learned that that's called ghosting, you know, and that is just so incredibly immature, and we as Christians have to be better than that, you know, we have to be able to talk to the people that want to talk to us, okay, it may not be pleasant, you know, I get lots of emails and phone calls that aren't pleasant, but Christian maturity, you know, what's it mean to have greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? What's it mean to have Christ in you, the hope of glory, if you can't put up with a little bit of unpleasantness? We, we looked at Romans 8 on Sunday morning that the light and momentary affliction that we're going through now can't be compared with the, the everlasting weight of glory in the future. You know, we Christians have to man up. We've got to set the example. We've got to be the ones that are courageous. You know, and so here's the Apostle Paul. Our mouth is open to you. Don't ghost us. Don't cut us off. Don't cop an attitude. Dialogue. Let us know where you are. He says, our mouth is open to you, O Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. You know, we're ready to dialogue. We're ready to be with you. And then he makes this amazing statement. Verse 12, he says, you're not being restrained by us. We're not the ones keeping you from communicating. We're not the ones keeping you from moving forward into maturity with the Lord, but you're restrained by your own feelings. Oh my gosh, is that ever true? You know, sometimes I just don't like that person. You know, I'm not going to forgive that person. I'm not going to communicate with that person. I'm, you know, 
Is that new? No, I think 2,000 years ago it was going on between Paul and the church at Corinth. And he says, you know, we're, we're not the ones holding you back, guys. Your own feelings are holding you back. And we're going we're gonna to hop from Corinthians into Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower. But this, this was so powerful for me. And I, I thought about being restrained by my own feelings because after watching those Facebook videos about that young man being brutalized last night, I was so mad. Honestly, I, 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 it took me hours to, to just get to, to, to where I didn't want to just, uh, you know, I, I could see, I could understand. I'm a fairly mature Christian, but I can understand where if somebody watched those videos and they were in that, they were in that mob tonight that's forming in downtown Bloomington, I can see where they would really hurt somebody, where they would burn a building, where they would cause major damage. I can, I, I know what those feelings are like. I had to wrestle with them last night when I watched that. And you and I, we have to be so good at controlling our feelings, even in tough situations, because I'll tell you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> things can get a lot tougher. It re reminds me of when, when things were real tough on Jeremiah. You know, he was, he was so picked on. He was so mistreated. You know, they, they put him in the stocks and flogged him when he didn't deserve it. Uh, they threw him in that cistern where he sunk in the mire at the bottom. And your only, your guess is as good as mine is what's in the, in the mire at the bottom of the cistern. They did all kinds of horrible things to him. And, and he griped to God. And God's answer is Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah chapter 12. And God said, you know, if, if you've run with the footman and you're tired, how will you do against the horses? In other words, hey, Jeremiah, this is light stuff. You know, if, if the real trouble comes, you got to be able to buck up against this stuff. And that's, that's how it is for us. You know, um, things could get a lot worse than they are now, a lot worse for Christians. And, and so we've really got to be the ones that control, control our feelings. And then the Apostle Paul's appeal uh, in verse 13, now in a like exchange, and what's the like exchange? Paul just said, our heart is open to you. So now in a like exchange, I speak as to my children, which Paul could write to them because he started the church in Corinth. There was no church in Corinth when the Apostle Paul got there. And he, he witnessed and witnessed hard and put up with a lot of stuff. And, and, uh, and yet he, he started that church and he says, so now in like exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide to us also. In other words, you know, open, open up to us, change your heart, uh, change your, change, let your, let, let your actions change your feeling, but, but open wide to us. And this, uh, this idea of, uh, letting your actions change your feelings, you know, um, that's so huge. It was, um, I think my first exposure to this was, um, my first exposure to this was in the Dale Carnegie book, which I believe um, was, is the one that's called uh, Stop Worrying and Start Living. And that was written, I think, in the 30s or something. But Dale Carnegie um, was my first exposure to the fact that, that feelings follow actions, not vice versa. That, that if you, and, and of course, this comes out in the sound of music, you know, she says, well, when I'm feeling afraid, and this and that, and the other thing, then I whistle a happy tune, and things get better. And it's, it's really true. Something will happen in your world that'll drive a feeling. And then if you start to act in a way that is godly, if you start to pray, if you start to think about the people you'll forgive, if you start thinking about the blessings of God, if you call somebody and you pray together with them, you begin to act in a godly manner, your feelings change. We don't have to act on our feelings if we will act in a godly way, like Julie Andrews discovered in The Sound of Music, then, then our, our feelings will shift, and, and that's an important thing. So that's what Paul is saying, you know, open wide to us, people, and We've got, to, we've got to act right to control our feelings. And with that, what I'd like to do is go to the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. So let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Um, and it, it says, on that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the lake. And by the way, this is his house. Uh, Jesus and his family had lived in Nazareth. 
and they were in, in, well ensconced in Nazareth until the, the Nazarenes uh, tried to kill him <laughs> by throwing him off a cliff, at which time he decided it would be a good idea to live in a different town. So he, uh, he moved to Capernaum and that's where he was and he got a house there and he went out of the house and was sitting by the lake, which of course is the, the Sea of Galilee, which is not really a sea, it's a lake. Um, and such great multitudes gathered to him that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things to them in parables. Um, and, and that's really true. You know, you can read Matthew 13 and 14 and it'd take you like five minutes. And, you know, that's one of the things I'll point out is we read through that if you read the parable of the sower here in Matthew, and then you read it in Mark, and you read it in Luke, there's there's little differences. People go, well, you know, he could have only said one thing. Why, why are there differences between the three Gospels? And it's like, you don't get it. You know, I can just, if Jesus Christ had just taught the, the, the parables that are, say, in Matthew 13, 14, something like that, and then left, you know, there'd be this mumbling in the crowd of people going, I can't believe I walked the entire day for a 15 minute teaching. <laughs> you know, Jesus, Jesus taught for a very, very long time, you know, and, and he said things all kinds of different ways, just like you do when you're having conversations. If you, just like Sue and I did earlier when we opened up, we were saying the same thing. We said it in different ways. We repeated ourselves with different words. You know, if you're trying to get a point across, you do that. And, and so whenever you, there's almost no conversation in the Gospels that is the total package. That's all that was said. There's almost invariably all kinds of other things that were said. And one Gospel will pick up on one thing and one Gospel will pick up another. And you get more of a picture of what's going on when you read all the Gospels together. So uh, verse 3, he spoke many things to them in a parable saying, pay attention, the sower went out to sow. Now, if we go to Mark chapter 4, in, in Mark 4, we see the opening of this. And let me see where it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. So in Mark 4, 3, uh, like verse 2 says, very much like Matthew, he was teaching them many things in parables. And so in verse 3, we get a fuller account where Christ says, listen pay attention. Now, the word pay attention in the King James is translated behold, but the, but the, the Greek, it, what it is, is it's an attention getter. And so in this point, uh, in this context, in Matthew, uh, in Mark, basically it gets to be translated pay attention because that's what he's saying. So he's, he's reduplicating. Listen, pay attention. And when Christ does that, then you and I need to go okay, this is something I really need to pay attention to. So he spoke to them many things, and he said, pay attention. So now you and I are paying attention. He says, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the path, and the birds came and devoured them. And uh, for those of you that have been on my Bible lands tour, and particularly if we go in the summer or the fall when there are weeds and thorns and bristles, and you see a pathway, and to the right and to the left, there's some thorns and thistles, and, and there's a path, and then there's a farmer's field, and that kind of thing. That's very, this is very, very biblical. Um, so the, the guys sewing and all the sewing, they didn't have any sewing machines, you know, machines that, that sewed the seed or anything. So everything was hand thrown. Sometimes you'd overthrow the field a little bit. And so he's, he's walking in his, uh, as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the path uh, where it's just really, you know, hard, that kind of thing. And the birds came and devoured them. Uh, verse five, and others, other seed fell on the rocky places. And as you, uh, in the, the fields, you know, it was rocks would appear and that kind of thing. And then they didn't have the big machinery that we have to remove some of those big deep rocks. So they just worked around them. He says, so some fell on rocky places where they didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. Uh, and when the sun rose, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. But others fell on the good soil and yielded fruit, 
some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. And then he makes this really uh, great statement, anyone who has ears to hear had better listen. And I think that's a really good translation. We talked about that a long time. Uh, verse 9, again, uh, anyone who had e has ears, which of course is everybody, that's an idiom for every one of you. <laughs> there's, there's nobody that doesn't have ears. <laughs> so anyone who has ears had better listen. Uh, one of the things you learn about Greek is the Greek imperative can either be permissive or it can be a command. Um, and so different scholars have made a judgment call as to whether or not this is permissive. So um, some of the versions you'll read, let him who has ears listen. And that's using the uh, the imperative in a permissive sense, let the one who has ears listen. But there are a growing number of scholars that feel in this case, the imperative uh, in Greek is better taken as a must, that if you have ears, you better listen to this. And that, that cues you and I, see we're reading this and we read that and we go, okay, so there's something in here that we really need to pay attention to as believers. And so we, we read on, um, and, uh, and then uh, verse 10, and, or verse, yeah, verse 10, and I, I love this. This is so interesting, because in verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And this is very interesting, because here Christ had gathered this big crowd. Remember, it says there was so much room, he couldn't even stand among them. Uh, he had to get into a boat. And so he's speaking from this boat, and, and then he speaks in parables to this crowd. And the disciples are confused. They're like, you know, what's the deal with the parables? You know, just, you just hit them right on with the truth, you know. And, and so they asked him that. Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, verse 11, to you it is given to know the sacred secrets, the musterion of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. Now, what's important to understand here is this is not a divine decree. This is a response to human desire. In other words, it's not like Christ said, well, I'm going to tell you guys, but I'm not going to tell them. He says, well, you know, you guys are different because you have hunger. And, and so he says to you, it's been given to know the sacred secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they had hunger, because they wanted to know because they hung around. Every one of you is listening to this tonight knows what it is to run into somebody with hunger because you've had hunger. You know what it is to want to know more, know more clearly, understand better. And you also know what it is to run into people that, you know, you, you talk to them about, say, the Christ coming to earth, the battle of Armageddon, the, the millennial kingdom, and they go, oh yeah, well, I just probably have to do with the future, you know, and they go on or something and go away. And, and you know, when, when God says, don't cast your pearls before swine, that isn't just for us. He does that. So God puts things out there that if you have hunger, then you hang around and you ask the questions and you want to know more. And if you don't have hunger, then you just simply, yeah, and you go your own way. And then he says in verse 12, for whoever has to him more will be given. Well, why would you have anything? Because you were hungry in the first place and you asked and you asked questions and you hung around. So if, if, you, if you have and you have that curiosity and that hunger, more will be given and then pretty soon you'll have an abundance. But whoever does not have, why don't they have? Because they didn't care. <laughs> That's why they don't have. From him will be taken away even that which he has. What's that mean? Use it or lose it. The human brain. If you don't, if, if you don't stick with something, if you don't focus something, it's like I, I think about the math that I used to know how to do that I don't know how to do anymore. <laughs> you know, including some of the business math. You know, it's just you haven't used it in 20 years, and it's just I just don't have it anymore. I could go back and relearn it, but you know, you get the idea. And he says, verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see. Why not? Because they don't have the curiosity to ask and say, excuse me, what do you mean? So they, they see stuff, but 
It, it doesn't register. Hearing they don't hear, neither do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear, but will never understand. Seeing you will see, but will never perceive. Why? This people's heart has grown fat and their ears are dull of hearing. Why is their heart grown fat? He didn't say they were born with a fat heart or God gave them a fat heart. Their heart grew fat, indolent, lazy. How did that happen? Well, you know, you feel comfortable. Um, you know, let's just take the commandments. You, you feel comfortable not knowing what the commandments are. You feel comfortable not doing the commandments. You feel like, I'm good enough to get into heaven. I'm sure I'm good enough to get into heaven. You never bother to find out if that's true or not. It's just the way you feel. And after all, the way you feel dictates the way things are, right? You know, and so the, the next thing, the, pretty soon you just have a, a lazy, fat, indolent heart that you're more than happy just to make up your own mind about what truth is and what's right and wrong. And, and heaven forbid that God should intervene and tell you that you're not right. You know, and this is where people today, you know, well, I, you, it, it offended me that you said I might not get into heaven. <laughs> okay. You know, wait till God says it. See how, it, how, how, how good it does you. You know, there, it, we've got to, and, and sometimes that means we got to take a risk. We got to shake people up, see if we can shake them out of their, their doldrums, so to speak. And then, and they have closed their eyes. Who closed their eyes? Not God. They closed their eyes. Why? Lest they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return to God and I heal them. And there are a lot of people that are just so um, satisfied with their own way that they don't want to know that God doesn't like what they're doing. They don't want to hear it. And so as a result, they close their eyes lest they should perceive and hear experienced that. I bet most of you listening to this and probably all of you have experienced that where people just say, I don't want to, you know, people say to you, I don't want to hear it. You know, you talk about prayer to somebody that, that doesn't pray. I, I don't want to hear it. What is that? That's a fulfillment of this verse, lest they should perceive. They, they don't want to hear it. They want to go their own way. They're happy with, what, with where they are and what they're doing. And they don't want to turn to God, so they don't want to listen, and they close their own eyes. And then verse, um, verse 16 goes on, but blessed, Christ talking to his disciples there, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear, because of hunger. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous people desired to see the things that you see and did not see them, and to hear the things that you hear and did not hear them. Christ is giving answers to questions that have existed for millennia. And he's doing things that people have wanted to see and showing, proving himself to be the Messiah. And so he, he says that, and it's, it's really true. The people that were hanging around Christ, that were asking the questions, were getting answers. And you didn't, you know, you, you didn't have to be an apostle to get the truth. It's amazing in the Gospels who gets the truth. Like when we read about Jesus Christ and coming into Capernaum and there's the woman with the issue of blood and she's been bleeding for 12 years and, and she's getting worse and worse. And, the, you know, the Bible doesn't say how she figured this out, what happened inside her heart, but somehow or other she figured out that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And she remembered the prophecy in the book of Malachi that the Messiah would have healing in the border of his garment. And so she said, wow, if I can just get close enough to him to touch him and grab the border of his garment, I will be made whole. And she went up and grabbed the border of his garment and she was totally healed. And there's no record of her, you know, ever having a, a great conversation with the Messiah. In fact, when Jesus, you know, immediately perceived by revelation that power had flowed out of him, because when you heal somebody, literally spiritual power moves out of you. And Christ perceived that he was, incredible. you know, gosh, he was, he was the Messiah. What can you say? And he, and so <laughs> he says, who touched me? And, and then you guys are, you probably know the record and, and the apostles are like, um, 
just you know we don't want to point this out <laughs> but but you know everybody and their brother is bumping into you you know and and trying to put their paws on you and you say who touched me and christ said no if somebody touched me i perceived that power came out of me and then the woman who you know was was she bold was she brassy was no she she came you know she was afraid she came trembling and it's kind of like i did it you know and then christ talked to her and just so she wouldn't be in guilt and condemnation but she was totally healed how did she figure out christ was the messiah bible is completely silent on that you know and so when the, the scripture talks about you know the the um you know, the, the people in knowing the truth, it, it's people that are hungry, God figures out ways to get them the truth. That's, that's as simple as it is. So Christ now in uh, verse 18 starts to explain the parable of the sower. So he says, verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches away that which has been sown in his heart. This is the one who's been sown along the path. Now, the, 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 uh, to me, the most powerful, uh, or certainly one of the most powerful lessons in the parable of the sower is that you determine the kind of soil that you are. You know, I remember as a brand new fresh believer reading this parable and praying, God, please let me be the good soil. Please let me be the good soil. I want to be the good soil because at that time in my life, when in my spiritual maturity, which I didn't have much of, the, the you know, I just thought you kind of were like, I don't know, again, you know, you just, you, you come to the Bible with the person that you were. I was raised atheist. I had never read a Bible. And I just assumed you were born the way you were born. So I read the parable of the sower and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, those poor people, some people are like rocky soil people and other people are thorn, thorny soil people. And, you know, and God, please let me be born one of these good soil people. And it was years and years before I realized that, no, you determine the kind of soil that you are. That's your decision to make up your mind about what soil you are. And, and more than that, if you're not diligent, you can change. You know, for example, even um, I, I, I will say that the young man that was, was brutalized um, on, on Facebook, he either posted or it was part of the post. I'd like I say, I don't do Facebook, so I, I don't really follow it. But what, what I did notice was how, um, how forgiving he sounded how unresentful he sounded. I mean, I was totally blown away. I was humbled. I was like, holy smokes, this is, this is one really, I mean, it was nothing in anything that he said about, you know, and I'm going to get back at them and I'm going to make sure they get theirs or whatever. He, he just spoke about, you know, uh, you know, the being, doing what was right, you know, and really, uh, and that's so amazing because something like that can happen in your life. You can be going along and do really well. And then something like that happen in your life. And the next thing you know, you become angry, you become bitter, and then you won't let go of it. You won't obey God and be forgiving. And the bitterness grows and the anger grows. And, and all of a sudden, what was at one time good fertile soil just becomes rocky soil. Or, you know, you can be doing well and you can be good soil and all of a sudden, you know, you're in a position in life where you start to see people who have things, they have things, they have money, and all of a sudden you become envious and you're like, I wish I had money. And then you start doing things to get money in the next, and that becomes your goal in life. And then you begin hedging on the edges and cheating and, and that kind of thing to get money. And you, you go from being good soil to being thorny soil. Well, you know, and thankfully, what we're hoping for is to run into a whole bunch of people that are all kinds of bad soil for different things. And by teaching them the word and teaching them about Christian maturity, they become better soil. And, and that's, that should be our goal in life is to change the soil that people are, because you are a type of soil. And so he says, you know, if you, if you hear the message about the kingdom and you don't understand it, okay, who is the one who knows you don't understand it? You are. <laughs> you know, I had, a, I had a gentleman call me today. John, I've been listening to your teachings. 
I've got some things that I don't understand. Do you have some time to talk to me? So as it turned out, he called at exactly the right time and we probably talked for 45 or 50 minutes. We covered about four different major topics, but he knew he didn't understand it and he pressed in to get understanding. And if, you know, if, if, you, if you hear something and you know you don't understand it, um, you, you don't wanna live in that condition, press in for understanding. Because um, if you don't understand it long enough, eventually the, the, the devil will wheedle in and it, it won't matter to you that you don't understand it. The, the subject won't matter to you. This has happened in the church so dramatically with so many things. Like, I don't understand the Trinity. And maybe if you're raised in a church, maybe when you're a young person, you know, um, it bothers you a little bit. I don't understand this. It doesn't make any sense. But by the time you get to be somebody who's gone to the uh, church for, you know, 30 years, all of a sudden, it doesn't bother you anymore that you don't understand the Trinity or, you know, some of the other stuff that is taught that isn't right. Like, how could there possibly be three days and three nights between Friday at sunset and Sunday morning while it's still dark out? And somehow or other, Friday sunset to Sunday morning while it's still dark is three days and three nights, Matthew 12, 40. It doesn't make any sense. That might bother you at some point. But then after you, you know, people assure you that somehow or other God did something to make that three days and three nights. Um, and, and then you, you lose that. And that's what happens if you don't understand something and you don't press in. And, and we know when we don't understand something. So it's our responsibility to press in. And then eventually the wicked one comes um, and snatches away the, the, the truth that's sown in the heart. And this is the person that's been sown along the path. So the lesson there is if there's a lot of things about religion you don't understand, press in to start getting answers. Uh, verse uh, 20. The seed that was sown on the rocky places. This is the one who hears the word and immediately with joy receives it. Yeah, praise the Lord. There's so many people that when they hear the word, it's like, yay. And yet he does not have any root in himself, Well, but is short-lived. Well, root is something that you develop. You know, I didn't have any root in myself when I got born again in 1971, Gosh, I didn't, <laughs> I knew what was in a class that I was taking, and that was about it, and I was taking that with a borrowed Bible, <laughs> you know, just, but, but somehow or other, it was kind of like, wow, this is really good stuff, and you, you read it, and you go to meetings, and you begin to develop a prayer life, and, and what happens, the same thing happens to you, is it happens to you put a seed in the dirt, and at first, it has no root. But gosh, you come back in a couple of days and there's little teeny tiny, tiny roots. And you come back in a couple of weeks and there's these bigger roots and the roots will grow. And, and that's, you know, when it says you don't have any root in yourself, if, if, if you've been around a while and you have no root, that's your fault. Honestly, if you've been around a while and you don't have any root, that's your fault. Do what it takes to develop, to develop roots. And, and some of that is just good, developing good habits. If the Bible says pray, so you make sure you pray. The Bible says get to learn God's word, so you get to learn God's word, that kind of thing. You know, you, you develop the root. And then what, if you don't have any root, then the verse goes on. Well, when hardship or persecution arises because of the word, you have a crisis of the faith. And, and you fall away. And, you know, and that's what can happen if you, if you don't have roots. Um, verse 22, now the one that was sown among thorns... This is the one who hears the word, but the worry of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, Mark adds, you know, there's other things as well. It chokes the word. And, and so all of a sudden things in your life become more important than the things of God. And this is something that um, even if you don't perceive it mentally, you perceive it physically. Like somebody that used to make sure they went to a fellowship meeting. If you talked about a church, they, they made sure that they at least got to church, say, three Sundays a, a month, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, they decide, they, they discover that they like fishing or they like golf or whatever, and then it's two Sundays a month, and then it's one Sunday a month, you know, and, and you can, you can, if someone will look at the, at the, at the physical, what's going on in the physical, then you can see 
you know, when the worry of the world or the deceitfulness of riches or there are other things and it comes up and it chokes the word so that all of a sudden it's like, I don't have time. I don't have time. And it, it chokes the word. And, and we can be aware of that. And then eventually the word isn't as important in somebody's life. And so they become unfruitful. Uh, and then verse 23, where we all want to go, the one that was sown on good ground, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. Now, is it an, an immediate, uh, instinctive understanding of the word? No, it could be, but that's fairly rare. Generally, it's <laughs> you understand it because you go to people that, that understand things better. You know, when I, when I first started studying the Old Testament, there were so many things I didn't understand. And so I developed a, a group of mentors, people that had been around a long time that I could call with questions. And I could tell that I was growing in the word in that in my study of the Old Testament, because when I first started out, everybody could answer every question. <laughs> and then within a couple of years, it was people were writing me back, John, I don't know the answer to this one either. <laughs> and so then you, you have to keep increasing your, the, the depth of your sources, so to speak. And, and you know, that's what happens. You, you hear the word and understand it. And then, and then you bear fruit. And you yield, and, and different people yield in different ways. And so some it's 100-fold, some 60, some 30. But it's, it's yielding good fruit, and that's what we want to do. And so on, in our lives, you know, we want to first of all realize that we choose what soil we are. We choose it. It isn't chosen for us. And everybody else chooses it too. So we have not only the high and holy privilege of making sure that we are good soil, but we have the amazing privilege where God's called us into his family, made us his ambassadors, given us the ministry of reconciliation, committed to us the word of reconciliation, and, and said, go out there and take all these rocky, choky soil people and, and help them be rich soil which, again, dealing with people, confronting people, it can be messy, it can be uh, sometimes you're the goat, um, thankfully sometimes you get to be the hero, um, you know, it, it takes great wisdom, it takes great tact, it takes a lot of prayer, it takes a lot of wisdom, um, you know, but we can help people leave their thorny, choky, rocky soil self and, and become good and fruitful for the kingdom of God, and that's a a tremendous privilege, a tremendous blessing. And of course, it's it's great for, you know, the people that are, are totally blessed. And we know that we're setting them up for a wonderful future. And then also continuing to deepen the word in our own life, which is always a tremendous blessing. So that's what I wanted to share tonight, that you and I determine the kind of soil we want to be. So let's make up our minds that we want to be good soil. Uh, God bless you guys. Thank you for being with me tonight. And, uh, you know, the floor is wide open for all kinds of discussion and comments and whatever we want to do. But I so appreciate your, your being with me tonight.